Misclick. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to another Healthy Gamer GG stream. My name is Alok Kanoji. Just a reminder, although I'm a psychiatrist, nothing we discuss on stream today is intended to be taken as medical advice. Everything today is intended to be shared for educational purposes only. And just a reminder that uh, if you all have a concern or question that is medical in nature, please go see a licensed professional and get some personalized advice. So hope y'all are doing well. Y'all need help? Yeah, so go get some help. Disclaimer, Andy, indeed. Welcome to another Healthy Gamer GG stream. Sorry for being a little bit late today. Um, had some stuff to take care of. Also spent some time. I, I really like some of the stuff that we're going to be covering today. So um, just wanted to make sure that, you know, I would thought through things. A hype train is close. Okay. Scam train, Inc. Chat. Get your dono buttons ready, I suppose. Sub buttons ready. Um, and that's interesting. I wondered, has Twitch learned that we're just, we have this starting soon thing and it's learned when, when to do it? Or is that actively done? I'm so curious now. So uh, if you're here for entertainment, I hope you will not be disappointed. So today we're going to be talking about a couple of different themes. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about dating and how to know if you're ready to date. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about what I would call the early life crisis. So I think a lot of people nowadays, um, you know, burnout is big. I think people, younger people are starting to become disillusioned with the world. And the interesting thing is that this is not like a new phenomenon. This is actually something that people used to, um, you know, we, we used to call the midlife crisis, right? The only difference is that, that this sort of existential, like, what am I doing with my life? I don't feel like going to work. I don't want to do anything. I don't know what to do. It's been happening for a while. It's just it used to happen later, and now it appears to be hap happening earlier. And so today, I think we're going to talk a lot about um, the early life crisis and sort of my experience of it in terms of working as a clinician as well as like my personal experience. But we're going to try to help you all understand a little bit about, you know, what is the early life crisis? How does it happen? Why does it happen? Um, what are the factors that contribute to it? And like, what's a general game plan at, at dealing with it? Uh, and, you know, I think a lot we're seeing more and more of these posts because I, I think we're seeing more and more professional interest here at HG. So um, to reflect that, I think our, our community is actually changing as a result. So we have a careers channel in Discord that if, if these kinds of issues resonate with you, I think our Discord is a great place to, you know, go and, and share your experiences, talk with other people who are experiencing the same things you are. Um, I think we have a bunch of like freelancers and software devs and, and other people, just also not those things. So I, I, maybe that's actually a mischaracterization. Um, so if, if that's, you know, we're, we try to support y'all in multiple ways, right? So we have some services and products and things like that, like coaching and Dr. K's guide and things like that, um, which I saw a post about earlier, actually, which is kind of funny. Maybe we'll start there. But then we also, uh, you know, have Twitch streams and YouTube and stuff like that. And then lastly, we have our, uh, maybe last, but certainly not least and arguably save the last, the best for last is our discord community. So we have a, a robust community of about 70,000 people that, you know, really support each other a lot. So thank you all very much um, for being a part of the community and posting things and, and all that good stuff. So, uh, yeah, let's get started. It's never too early to have a crisis. Wise words. Roswell rat. <laughs> Right? Spoken like the true rat. <laughs> it's never too early. 
I wonder what, how old are rats? They live about two years, right? Do they have their midlife crisis at one year? Um, okay. So we'll just start with this. This is a little bit of a meme post, but let's dive in. So the guide is a huge dis disappointment because in the end, I've actually got to put in the work. Obviously joking, so I'm marking this as a meme. Ha ha. But seriously, I got the guide over the holidays for my husband and I, and we're slowly working through it both together and alone, and it's just so difficult. In the end, we've got to put the videos on, pay attention, meditate. What's difficult for you? I can't tell if this is sarcastic or not, but, you know, I think part of, uh, maybe people don't really realize that the, the guide is like somewhat different, right? It's not just like streams. So streams are a little bit low, not engage. They're a little bit more entertaining. Like we ask less of you on stream, right? But in the guide, like we're going to ask you to do things. Like the information is dense. You're going to have to pay attention. We're going to give you guys worksheets and exercises. And like the goal of the guides is to actually help people understand themselves and like grow as human beings. So it does involve work. Um, and, and that's sort of what's a little bit different, right? So in the streams, like we, we sort of recognize that people are coming in from all over the place. They may not be ready to put in the work. Um, and so if, if, if streams are helpful, that's wonderful, right? So we recognize that they are helpful. But, you know, if you really, I think the guides are really designed for people who are interested in a deeper dive, interested in understanding themselves a little bit more, interested in putting in more work and interested in getting more value, which is why they're sort of designed the way they are. Um, but hopefully, you know, stick with it and pay attention and meditate and you'll start to see some benefit. I'd be super curious whether this person, and this is the other thing, I've never heard of a husband and wife kind of going through it together, but I think that's fantastic. Like, I hope it suits you well. Um, okay. So what do y'all want to do first? So we've got some stuff about early life crisis and we've got stuff about dating. What do y'all want? Can we get a poll? Ooh. Pull, pull, pull. Okay. We're going to do both. It's what do we do first? So I've learned, chat, I have learned that if I ask you which one do we want to do, we're SOL. Because y'all will never be happy with just one. So... We're going to do both. It's just which one we're going to do first. So here's the other way to think about this. When I tend to start off, I tend to be like, in a sense, a little bit chiller, but I also have more like staying power. And then towards the end, I'm going to be a little bit more disinhibited, a little bit more discombobulated, and things may be a little bit more entertaining, but they may be a little bit less organized. So that's the other thing. We're going to do two on dating. Okay. Okay. Um, do you have gray hair now? Yeah, I have gray hair. I don't know if you guys can see. But yes, I do have gray hair now. Um, okay, so it looks like we're doing the early life crisis. Wonderful. I mean, not wonderful that people have the early life crisis, but, you know, I'm glad that y'all... Okay. Let's take a look. Ooh, I wonder if we're going to need it. All right. <clears throat> Come on, wireless network. I know you can do it. I know you can connect. I have faith in you, child. Don't. Okay. By the way, so if we're doing early life crisis, we may do like a more in-depth meditation right after this one, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look. We're going to start that and let's take a look. So let's talk a little bit about early life crises. So university broke me. How can I begin to dig myself out of the ditch I've found myself in? I'm a 23-year-old female. I graduated from university with a 4.0 GPA and multiple honors in a supposedly lucrative field seven months ago. My last year of uni, I pushed myself to my physical limit and am now paying the price for it. 
I would go for multiple days without sleeping, mul- many times a week at a time with, without eating, among, among other extremely drastic and unhealthy behaviors. I won't go into detail uh, on. and was essentially fueled by candy and a need for academic excellence. My roommates were genuinely scared I was going to die because of the state I was in, and honestly, in a way, I did. I literally feel like I broke myself both physically and mentally during this year-long self-induced hell. Now, seven months later, I'm absolutely struggling to stay afloat. I live with my parents. I wake up around 4 p.m., eat and take supplements, B12, D3, and iron by my doctor's orders, sit on my phone slash game feeling exhausted, and then sleep at 3 a.m. I struggle to shower and usually don't. I struggle to eat. My room is a disaster and I can't get myself to do laundry. I just feel like shit all the time and can't be asked to do anything more than sit down. I'm still unemployed after giving up on my job search a few months ago due to rejections and lack of available options. Additionally, as time goes on, I don't want to think about work or using my brain as it immediately makes me think of my horrible time at university. I feel like I traumatized myself regarding hard work. All I have to do... All I have to show for my my academic career is my stress-induced gray hair and horrible skin. And let's not forget a 4.0 with multiple honors, right? I used to have a lot of hobbies and be a very busy person, but attempting them now doesn't bring me any fulfillment. I have no desire to create. It feels like my soul is gone. Additionally, I feel bad even trying anything because to my parents, it looks like I'm wasting time if I do anything other than job hunting. I generally lock myself in my room and avoid them. For the first few months, my parents would chastise me for my lifestyle, but at this point they've mostly given up on me. Only a snide comment once in a while regarding my unemployment, laziness, dependency, etc. They know I'm in a funk, their term, but don't know what to do, as I don't either, nor do I, I even want to do anything. I just really don't care about anything anymore. I don't want a job, even an interesting one. I don't care to look good or to be clean. I don't care to learn how to drive. I don't care what my family thinks. Yet somehow, here I am. And something still makes me burst into tears in the early morning thinking about how much I have let my parents and myself down. So clearly something inside me is still alive and gasping for air, and it's begging for some help. Please excuse the dramatic metaphor. Much excused and actually much appreciated, right? So I I really appreciate how this person is able to put into visuals their personal experience. Because we can't just say, I'm sad and burnt out, right? That doesn't capture what this person is going through. So we tend to see this more and more in our society, right? So this is the case of like something. So I'd say like on one end of the spectrum, we've kind of got like a burnt out gifted kid. And then as the burnt out gifted kid doesn't burn out quite early enough, we end up with like this kind of person, which I would sort of call the early life crisis. And this is a case where someone is very, very driven, very, very successful, very burnt out and doesn't, his like thrown in the towel. They're like, I don't want to work. I don't want to do anything. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I don't even want to do anything with my life, let alone know what I should be doing. I just know that things are bad. I've made tons of sacrifices and I feel like crap. So what I want to start with is like understanding why this is happening more. Like what's changed? Why is this happening so much now? Is this, is it because this generation is the weakest generation in the history of humanity? On the contrary, right? There's a lot going on here. So we're going to start by digging into what's going on. The next thing that we're going to do is talk a little bit about how we get here, right? So there are some societal factors And one of the interesting principles that I appreciate a lot from medicine is that, you know, when someone has, let's say, depression or anxiety or whatever, this is usually a combination of like personal factors, social factors, and like particular circumstances. So how do we predispose ourselves to burnout and how has society taken some of our internal vulnerabilities and exploited them resulting in burnout? We're going to talk a little bit about mental health and sort of why mental health is getting worse uh, in the world and sort of like what that sort of means, because there are also societal factors at play there. And then finally, what we're going to try to do um, in a very general sense is talk a little bit about, you know, what's the formula to get out of an early life crisis? And 
big caveat there that, you know, this is something that is going to be a generalization. This is sort of, I've worked with dozens of people who are kind of in this situation. Starts maybe even younger than this. I've started with like 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds. Had my fair share of people in their early 20s, but also like people into their mid-30s. And how do you start to like make sense of your life, find a direction, and be motivated to pursue it? So we're going to talk about that. Okay. So to start with, we're going to launch into... Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about why this is happening more, right? So... So to begin with, we were sort of told that we should, um, you know, so th there's a group of us that sort of grow up with high expectations. Okay. So like 50 years ago, there was a formula for success. And let's say that formula was to get a bachelor's degree and then based on a single income, you could support a family, right? And that was pretty easy, easy. And so this was a formula that was repeated time and time and time again to where, to the point where it became kind of like accepted, right? Like that this was how you become successful. This was the path for success. And everyone kind of understood it. A lot of people pursued it and it worked. But there's something that's really interesting that if you kind of look at the formula for success, like the more people do it, the less valuable it becomes. So why was a bachelor's degree like the source of success? It's because like that's how you distinguished yourself, right? So with, uh, there's like, let's say, 10 people with no degree. And so if you're the one person with a degree, your financial security is like a lot better, right? You're at an advantage. So over time, as people adopted the path of success, what happened? With bachelors, right? So everyone started getting bachelors. And so now what's happened is that the baseline now includes four years of effort. So the baseline here used to be zero years. So what we've done is added four years of effort to the baseline. And so how do you distinguish yourself now? You go get an MBA, right? Or you get a master's degree. And what's become the norm? What have we seen an explosion of in the last 20 years, right? Everyone wants to get an MBA. So now what we see is tons of positions where it's like, in order to be a school teacher, you need a master's degree in education. So like, you know, which is like, it's not necessarily a bad thing by itself, right? It's awesome that we have more competent teachers who have learned stuff. And there's some value here. Don't get me wrong. Like, so uh, theoretically, people with bachelor's degrees will know more than people who don't have bachelor's degrees. I'm not saying that the MBA is a bad thing. But now what we've got is MBAs are a dime a dozen, right? It's like sort of like something that everyone kind of does. So now what we've done is we've added on two years of effort. And this isn't just, I'm using degrees as an example, but we kind of like see this in, in this person's uh, post is that they've graduated with a 4.0 with multiple honors and they're still having trouble getting a job, right? So like it used to be that 4.0 with multiple honors, and like getting a job would be like pretty easy because you had distinguished yourself. But now what's going on is it's not just about degrees, it's about internships. How did you spend your sh summers, right? Did you intern? It's about networking. Do you go to conferences? Do you have publications, right? It's about getting honors. A 4.0 isn't enough. So medical schools, for example, like they just don't want someone with a 4.0. They want someone who's well-rounded, who's done research, volunteer work, right? They've done like, they've worked for Doctors Without Borders, or things like that. Like we want like special people. So what's happening is as the formula for success says this is the bar, we've been raising it. And so now what we're seeing as a result is like people are burnt out. Why? Because to get here, it used to require zero years of effort and then it required four years of effort and now it's requiring six years of effort and now it's requiring all this other stuff just to get to the baseline and you're still having trouble getting a job. 
So essentially what's happening on a colossal scale in our society is that we are raising the bar of average. And so what this means is that like you have to put in, in, in this amount of work that you have to put in is not like decreasing, right? Do you guys get that? Because this is a relative calculation. So, you know, if I practice for 10 hours and someone else practices for 20 hours versus zero versus 10 hours, even the difference between us is going to be the same, but the total amount of work and effort that our society demands of us has increased. So what I see with 16 years, uh, 16 year, year olds, right? So I, I, when I was back in Boston, I had a pretty large patient pa panel from people who went to like prep schools. So prep schools are another great example of this. So these places like Phillips Exeter, Phillips Andover, Collegiate in New York, all this kind of stuff, where these are kids that like now to be competitive for college, you have to go to a prep school where you study like 80 hours a week. And this is a high school, right? And so once one prep school starts doing it, the other prep school kids have to keep up because they want to go to Ivy League institutions. They want to go to Harvard. They want to go to Yale. They want to go to Stanford, right? And so like they're pushing themselves more and more and more. People are getting more and more competitive. I know this even from my own residency. So when I applied to residency, you know, like I was a pretty strong applicant, obviously got into a very strong program at Harvard. And then like four years later, I'm reviewing applications and holy wow, those candidates blew me out of the water. I once had a, a I was mentoring a student from who is an undergrad whose application for medical school was way stronger than my application for residency. She like hadn't even gone through medical school and had accomplished more as a, like a researcher and volunteer work and all this kind of stuff than I had like after medical school, right? So what's happening in our society is that we're demanding more and more of people. We're demanding more, we're raising the bar. And as a result, people like that, a total amount of work that people are investing is increasing, okay? So this is not just, um, yeah. So that's the first thing to understand. So this is one of the key reasons. This is what I've seen in terms of burnout. So as more and more kids come into my office, like I see this more and more college students, undergrads, at I mean, even high schoolers at prep schools, high schoolers at like magnet schools, uh, whatever the other kinds of kind of experimental schools are, you know, we're seeing this just more and more. So what are the personal elements that capitalize or what are the personal vulnerabilities that open you up to this kind of like, societal problem, okay? So the first thing that I see in a lot of early life crisis is pressure from parents or society, like or immediate social circle is another way to put it. It doesn't have to be your parents, right? This is where like, and we kind of see this tone from the parents where like the parents have no idea how to understand what this person is going through. So just call it a funk. Right? Do y'all get how... So I, let's just look at this for a second. So the parents call this a funk, right? But like, listen to this experience. Like, I just don't care anymore. I don't want a job, even an interesting one. I don't care to look good or to be clean. I don't care to learn how to drive. I don't care what my family thinks. Something inside me bursts into tears in the early morning thinking about how much I've let my, my parents and myself down. So clearly something inside me is like still alive and gasping for air and it's begging for help. And the parents are like, it's a funk. This, dear audience, is not a funk, right? So I, I don't blame, I know it sounds like I'm blaming the parents, but what I'm really pointing out here is the lack of sophistication of vocabulary and understanding of like what this person's experience is, right? So like, what's the solution to a funk? I don't know, you just wait until people get out of it, right? That's the strategy. Let's just wait until she gets out of it. Because a funk implies like some kind of weird temporary thing. Like I'm just in a funk. What's, there is no solution to a funk. And so this is why problems are getting perpetuated, right? Because no one is like being critical about what's going on here. What is this person's needs? What are their challenges? How can we support them? It's a funk. So we're just going to kind of like AFK and wait until it fixes itself, right? Which is like actually not a bad, bad plan when it comes to parenting. I mean, that's most of parenting, to be honest. 
But I think this is kind of like a really important point, which is that, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on here in terms of like letting yourself down, letting your parents down, like your parents kind of nagging you and then they stop nagging you. And then once they stop nagging you, that's when you actually like really feel bad because that's when they've given up on you, right? They've like written you off as like hopeless. And so like any way you look at it, like the parents, like whether they nag you or don't nag you, whether they push you or don't push you, like either one is going to screw you over even more, make you feel worse about yourself. But one thing that I do see very commonly is that, you know, kids with 4.0 GPAs in majors that are lucrative fields who get multiple honors usually have something from here, right? Not all of them. Like some people are just very self-motivated and they set a standard for themselves. But as this person sort of says, like, I'm disappointing my parents, like that sort of starts with like pressure from parents, right? So the second thing, is a desire to excel. This is really important, right? So it's one thing to get pressure from your parents, but it's another thing to get pressure from yourself, right? So you can get pressure from your parents. And usually pressure from your parents results in like mediocre GPAs with a lot aligned. It doesn't result in a 4.0 with multiple honors. So this is where like you have a desire to excel. And now what's happening is that this desire to excel in an old society would have been enough with a B bachelor's degree, right? Or maybe enough to be an MBA, but that's not enough for you. So you have decided that somewhere within you, you don't get a 4.0 with multiple honors with one year of burning yourself out, right? That's not how you get a 4.0. You can't not eat and not sleep for one year and wind up with a 4.0. This is a four-year endeavor, right? And this is a commitment to excellence. So 4.0 with multiple honors means like you know, like you did awesome. You did uh, far outperformed all of your classmates. And so there's an internal desire to excel, which when combined with a society, which says, by the way, in order to excel, I mean, uh, in, in order to excel, the price for success is now your like physical and mental well-being. It used to be 40 hours a week. Now it's like 80 hours a week. We've upped the cost. There's inflation of effort in order to satisfy the desire to excel, okay? Um, so, the next thing that we're sort of gonna talk about, and this is, the desire to excel can be there, but the desire to excel has to be combined with the motivation to sacrifice. Right? And this is what this person did. So like, here's the price for excellence. It's 80 hours a week. And by the way, you have to like be willing to give up certain things. So when we look at burnout, a big part of that is, is oh, if you guys saw our, our, you know, our last interview where we talked to someone who was burnt out from four different jobs, what we sort of noticed is that there's like a tendency and a motivation to sacrifice. Like I'll pay whatever price it gets. Uh, I need to, to get the 4.0, right? And that's why you stop sleeping. Stop eating. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? None of these things are bad. The key thing is this plus the way that society has changed is what leads to the recipe of, for disaster and burnout, right? So this is where like society is kind of changing. I'll give you guys just a couple of examples of this, okay? So about three years ago, I worked with a fair number of NFL players. And for those of you that are outside of the United States, like there's this thing called American football. And so American football is probably the largest sport in America. And the thing about being a professional NFL player is that like it was maybe a six hour a day job. Okay. And that's just because like you can't physically exercise for like more than like four to six hours a day. Okay. And it's just not, so, so there's like constraints on what you can physically do. Okay. And so as a result, like NFL players that like, I would talk to them, you know, how much do you practice? What do you do? Okay. We do this. We have like this meeting, like the coach talks to us, you know, like uh, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll exercise for this much. We have this many hours of practice. We have this kind of like scrim kind of stuff going on. Like you know, there's only so much you can do because of the physical limits of the human body. So in the past two years, I've worked with pro esports athletes, three years, 
let's say. And does anyone know? So these guys practice for six hours a day, maybe five to six uh, days per week. Do you all know how much a pro esports athlete practices per day? Oh, 14 is at the lower end, my friends. So we're talking like 14 to 20 hour days. Six to seven days a week. Right? So I think like if you look at what it takes to be a professional athlete in a physical sport and what it takes to be a professional athlete in an esport. So I recognize that this statement is going to be like somewhat controversial. It just takes more in esports. Right? And I'm just talking about, I'm not talking about like that this is the only comparison I'm making, but I think it's a pretty fair one is that in order to succeed in esports, you need to work for 16 hours a day on average. On average, six to seven days a week. That's what it takes. So if we want to talk about effort inflation and how society is changing, here's example number one, right? So the world is changing. Here's the second thing. So just to give you guys another example. So I have a client who's in the film industry. And what they, what they told me is that like they have to respond to emails within an hour. So if someone is like looking for, you know, to fill a particular role for a commercial or whatever, right? And like as an agent, if, if you get a query and you do not respond within an hour, the job will be gone. So it used to be like 50 years ago, like a rush job would take a week, right? In the days of like physical mail and like fax machine, like a rush job would be like three days, right? Mail would take a week. Like shipping would be like, I remember back when I used to build my own computers at the age of 15, I would like order things from Newegg and then like parts would start rolling in over the course of weeks. And then a month later, I would have like whatever cooling gel that I need that attaches my processor to the motherboard or whatever. And then I could like build my computer. Whereas now it's like, you know, you click a couple buttons and then like some drone from Amazon drops stuff off like inside your house, right? So the pace of society is increasing. Okay. And so what this results in is like bad for our mental health. And I recognize that this too is an uncalculated term, bad, right? Because this is where things get like, you know, they fraction out into a lot of different stuff, okay? So this is where, um, you know, th there's all kinds of like problems that result in negative mental health. The first is, so as we burn out, we have at our fingertips dopaminergic trash. Call this whatever you want to. You can call it, I don't want to call out any particular platform because I honestly don't think that's fair. We have so much dopaminergic trash at our fingertips. So like when I feel burnt out and I don't feel like doing anything, I can still scratch particular itches through playing a video game or watching YouTube or being on my phone or whatever. Reddit, Twitch, like whatever, right? And so there's like evidence. I recently saw a study that TikTok worsens depression and anxiety. Big surprise. Who's surprised at this point, right? This is going to be the kind of thing where 20 or 30 years from now, or maybe 40 or 50 years from now, much like we did with smoking, like everyone is going to look back and say, I can't believe we let this public health problem go on for so long that we ruined. So there was a, you know, asbestos and, and cigarettes ruined our lungs for like decades. And decades from now, we're going to look back and we're going to look at all these like technologies and we're going to say like this stuff ruined our brains. Right. We had a whole generation of people who were growing up with like motivation cancer because of all this dopaminergic crap. OK. And, and so there's evidence that, you know, Facebook, TikTok, whatever. Like gaming. And so this kind of stuff, what this does is this didn't used to exist. Right. Like you couldn't like sure you could be into comics and read the newspaper and read books, but that stuff just isn't as addictive. And as a result, like this dopaminergic trash kicks us while we're down. And this is why we get so stuck. Right? Because like this happened fine. Like personal vulnerabilities, like that is manageable. Add in societal stuff, that gets harder. And then add in the mental health stuff, and then we stay stuck in the pit. And you can sort of feel this, right? Like 
How do I dig myself out of the ditch? And I think it's really this mental health component that is like the final nail in the coffin. This is what makes it so hard to like do anything, right? Because this person isn't interested anymore. They like don't even know what to do. They don't feel like doing anything. So mental health is like the, the, sort of the, the final thing. And this can manifest as all kinds of stuff. So like depression, right? Anxiety. So this person appears to be anhedonic, right? Which may or may not have to do with depression. This person also just uses the word they've been traumatized by university, right? To where like their brain has learned. So this is how I would interpret this. Their brain has learned that, by the way, if we sign up for this crap again, all of these personal vulnerabilities are going to reactivate. My desire to excel, my desire to make my parents proud, my motivation to pay whatever it takes, plus the pace of society where rush jobs are going to be expected, lucrative field, by the way. So do you think that lucrative fields are going to have very, very cushy, fun environments where they care about your mental health? Or are they going to grind you, exploit these personal vulnerabilities, and then burn you out again? Which one do you think? Combined with whatever amount of trauma, trauma you've done to yourself, anhedonia you've done to yourself, combined with the fact that your brain can get an easy hit of dopamine by playing video games for four hours instead of like applying for jobs and stuff like that, and then you find yourself in the ditch. And then you find yourself in the early life crisis. This is how you get here. So then the question is, how do we get out? So... The first thing you've got to do is cleanse your debuffs, okay? Deal with the handicaps, deal with the stuff that's holding you back. So this person, I think, has done an awesome job because they went and they saw a medical doctor, okay? So this is very, very important. So I know it sounds kind of weird, but I'd start with medical evaluation and that includes mental health evaluation. So here's why this is important. So if I have major depressive disorder or bipolar disorder or whatever, right? So I've seen a lot of people like this that could be hypomanic, by the way. I'm not saying this person is hypomanic. I'm really not trying to make a diagnosis. I'm just saying that, you know, literally working in the emergency room at Massachusetts General Hospital, we see a lot of hypomanic kids from places like Northeastern, MIT, Harvard, that fit this bill perfectly, right? So this is sometimes the way that occult hypomania can manifest. So this is why it's very, very important that the first thing you should do is go see a medical professional because here's the thing. So we can infer a couple of things, but like, let's just take a look at this. Like, let's look at common things being common, right? So if you're a woman, you could be iron deficient, right? If you're a human who uses technology, you could be vitamin D deficient. right? If you have a, a large personal stressor, this could trigger um, a mental illness. So what do I mean by trigger? So there's evidence that, for example, like we have genetic predispositions towards particular mental illnesses and that certain life circumstances or other events can cause that vulnerability to manifest as an illness. So a good example of this is there's a lot of research that shows that people with schizophrenia or who have a high risk of schizophrenia can trigger the activity of their schizophrenia through marijuana use or other kinds of substance use. Now, there's a lot of debate within the community. I don't think we have a clear answer because we can't really do trials on this sort of thing. Is the marijuana, it's unlikely that the marijuana is by itself causing schizophrenia, although that's an option. But the, the best argument that I've heard from the most knowledgeable experts in schizophrenia that I've talked to basically believe that if you are going to get schizophrenia, using pot will ca cause you to get it earlier and will actually cause more damage because the earlier you get sch like sch your schizophrenia manifests, the harder it is to like do things. So if schizophrenia manifests in high school, it's like harder to study, harder to get into college. And if you haven't gone to college, then, you know, it's gonna, like the rest of your life is going to be harder, etc. So 
all these kinds of early life stressors can trigger mental illnesses, which in turn means that you should get a mental health evaluation to get treatment for depression. Right? So we don't necessarily know that this person has depression. In order to understand that, we would have to do a thorough diagnostic evaluation, which involves like, you know, asking them tons of questions about their sleep, appetite, has this happened to you before? How do you feel? Is there suicide? All that kind of stuff. So this could be going on, right? We don't really know. So if you are in a situation where you're in an early life crisis, it is very, very important and it behooves you to get both a medical and a mental health evaluation. Because anything that's going to happen after this is going to be increasingly difficult if you have an active iron deficiency or you're actively in a major depressive episode, right? That's just going to make life harder for you. Like, it's hard enough already. The least last thing that you want to do is, like, have active medical illness or mental illness that's interfering with your ability to move forward. So this, by the way, can also be transformative. I mean, I've had patients that you know, didn't realize that they have vitamin D deficiencies and iron deficiencies. And they just walk around every day, like operating with their battery, like half charged. And so everything feels exhausting to them. They can work for six hours, but once like 2 p.m., 3 p.m. rolls around, like they just can't do anything because they, they have these physiologic problems, right? So those can be fixed. And thyroid deficiency is another good example of stuff that like once you fix it, like it can be cured. Like people will be like, oh my God, I had no idea that life was, could be this easy. I didn't realize that I was playing at a handicap this entire time. Second thing, okay? So this is a skill that we didn't need to use to have. Learn how to set healthy boundaries. This is crucial, 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 crucial. So this can manifest in this particular person with all kinds of things like parent boundaries with parents, right? So this person retreats into their room and doesn't leave, which doesn't help their mental health, right? If you're stuck in your room and on your computer all day. And why are, do you retreat to your room? It's because of the way that your parents interact with you. So like developing a healthier relationship with your parents, setting healthier boundaries with your parents. So here's another, like, I'll give you guys just an example of something that I see a lot. So back in the day, like let's say 50 years ago, if you were 23 and you hadn't found a job and you were looking for jobs here and there, which by the way, this person is doing, right? This person is like looking for jobs. So maybe not right now, but they did for a while. What did looking for a job used to mean 50 years ago? It meant getting up, showering, getting dressed, getting in your car, driving to a place, picking up applications, dropping off physical applications, going out for interviews. And so when your parents, when looking, when that's what looking for a job looks like, how do you think your parents treat you, right? It's like more respectable because you're like up and out of the house. They can see your effort and therefore their snide comments will be far less. Now, what is looking for a job look like? Being in your PJs, you know, chili slobber down the front of your, your shirt, clicking buttons on the internet in your room with the door closed. So this is the kind of thing where like, once again, society has changed. And as a result, like it's way easier to be disrespected for doing the same thing that you would have done 50 years ago. You're doing the same damn thing, but it's way easier for people to think that you're not doing anything, right? So like the snide comments are gonna be much more common. So this is where learning how to set boundaries with your parents is very important, but it's not just bound parents, right? Second thing is like set boundaries with technology. And this is why I call learning to set boundaries like a core skill, right? This is like core general skill, like cleansing your debuffs, okay? So this is where like learning how to set limits, like, okay, like when are we going to hop onto the gaming, right? When are we going to hop onto YouTube? When are we going to hop onto our phone? Learning how to set healthy boundaries, doing a dopamine detox. Like, so dopamine detox is an option. And this is something that people on our Discord server, I think, have been doing with more, you know, organization and frequency. This could be like learning to set very simple limits, like no phones in bed. Right? If you don't feel like working, that's okay, but just no phones in bed because that's going to propagate the problem. Right? No phones on the bed, like on the nightstand. Phone needs to be across at the other end of the room or zipped up in your backpack or somewhere like that. No phones, like, you know... We're not going to game until we do something for two hours. 
So no gaming until I shower. Like you can set super, super low hanging fruit in terms of like limits on yourself, but it's absolutely important to set some kind of limits on technology. Not really an issue in this case, but I think it's also important to learn how to set limits on SOs. So this is where, you know, sometimes you're dating this person. Sometimes you are this person in a relationship and unhealthy boundaries with SOs can be like a big, big problem, like contribution to, you know, like your general mental health. And so this too, like dating has changed. We're going to kind of get to that a little bit, but I think that like setting healthy boundaries with your SO is very, very important. So parents, SO, other close relationships where like you can even tell them, hey, I want you to like push me to get out of bed and like don't let me game for like two hours after I wake up. Can you please help me with that? And I know that sounds kind of like asking for a favor, but that's also like in like having healthy boundaries with your SO. And that could mean healthy boundaries could mean having them push you, right? Asking for their help. It could mean like, hey, it really doesn't help me when you make snide comments. So SOs really aren't an issue, it, it sounds like, in this situation. But when I talk to people who are in early life crises, this is often like a big part of the problem, which is that they're with an SO who like does not encourage them to do the right things and doesn't support them in the right way. We had an interesting post about this recently as well, kind of on the other side of the equation, where a, a woman was sort of saying, how do I support my boyfriend with depression? And so that's where like setting healthy boundaries with your boyfriend was an important part of that, right? And the last place to set healthy boundaries with is your friends. Sometimes frenemies. So this is also where like you have to learn how to set boundaries with like the company that you keep, right? So this is where if you are going nowhere in life and you hang out on Discord with a bunch of people who are going nowhere in life, then it's really, really easy for all of y'all to go nowhere together, right? And this is the kind of thing where I'm not saying that we shouldn't empathize with each other. I'm not saying that we shouldn't, you know, try to support each other. I have my, you know, friends who I game with and stuff like that. Like gaming can be a healthy part of coping and dealing with distraction and stuff like that. Absolutely. And at the same time, you should set some limits with them, right? So this is not the kind of thing where you want to log on to Discord first thing in the morning if logging on to Discord moves you in the wrong direction. So this is where you have to be a little bit critical about the company that you keep. Is this person helping me move in the right direction? Is this per person helping me like achieve what I want to achieve, right? And sometimes friends can also be an emotional drain on you. Every time I log on to Discord, do I find myself like spending my emotional energy supporting this person? I'm not saying you should abandon your friends. We're not saying cut things out. In fact, quite the opposite. We're not saying go no contact with your parents. We're not saying give up all technology. We're saying learn how to set healthy boundaries. Okay? Next thing. So this is also this also kind of becomes a little bit important. I'm gonna take a quick aside because once again, society has changed. So like if we think about you know setting boundaries, like society used to set boundaries for us. So I'll give you guys just a simple example. So let's look at bullying. Okay? So it used to be that I go to school, I get bullied, I go home and no more bullying, right? But with the advent of things like Twitter and social media, my bullies can follow me around wherever I go, right? This is also where like society used to have like boundaries around stuff. So we used to like go to work, right? And now even with work from home, boundaries have gotten a lot muddier. So a lot of people that I work with, young professionals that I work with are struggling to set boundaries between like when to stop working because there's no like physical space Im imposed anymore, right? So you have to learn how to set that internal boundary of like logging off from your phone at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. or whatever. There are some days even like in a normal work environment where you'd stay late because you've got a project to finish. So now this is where like physical space has changed. And so as a result, you have to learn how to set boundaries at work. Okay. So there's a lot of like boundary setting, which didn't need to be necessary any before because society would set it for us, right? We had natural protection from bullying. We had natural protection from our parents snide comments because we would leave the house to go to a job interview or fill out a job application. We had physical space between work and home and that's all changing. So as a result, we have to adapt with these circumstances, right? We have to adapt to accommodate for these kinds of things. Last thing is figure out what you want. 
and I know this makes it sound like just do it, but let's talk about this, okay? So then when I say something like this, people are like, how on earth do I do that? This feels so hard. Right? And let's like think about that for a second. Why does it feel so hard to figure out what you want? That's because society has made it so that we didn't have to do that before, right? So like in the old days, I mean, this is still prevalent in India now, but like, let's just use the example of the caste system in India. So like, you know, a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago, like figuring out what you wanted was irrelevant because society told you, hey, do this based on your caste. This is what you're going to do. And you can't, that's your option. There's no options, right? The formula was laid out. And even, even in terms of what we were talking about earlier with this stuff, right? This formula was laid out. And like, why is this? So like it, society used to have, for, have formulas laid out for us. So what that means, so the formula was laid out, a bunch of people followed the formula and they did fine, right? This is why like the baby boomers don't understand us. And it's in, in, in turn, because we don't understand them because the world they grew up in was just different where the formulas they followed worked, right? They don't work for us anymore. And so this is why it feels so hard because we were never taught as like in the history of humanity, we have never had as much freedom and confusion about what to do as we have now. We never had to figure things out as people on the level of, on the order of magnitude that we have to now. Do I go to college? Do I not go to college? Do I major in something? Do I not major in something? Do I work as a freelancer? Do I work as an entrepreneur? Do I move into content creation? Do I start a YouTube channel? How many hours a day do I spend in my job? How many hours a day do I spend working on my YouTube channel? Does my YouTube channel gonna bring me revenue? Can I stream on Twitch? Can I become a TikTok personality? If I wanna become a content creator, which, tic which personality do I, which platform do I pick? Do I run for politics? Do I run, so I, uh, you know, someone in my personal life ran for student body president of a major university and won. And they're campaigning, they're a complete introvert. All of their campaigning was online. They sat at a computer the whole time. They never met a single student and they still won. So the world is changing. And the world has traditionally given us a formula to follow. And this is why it feels so hard because even this person's parents don't know what to do, right? They're like, it's a funk. They don't know what to call it. They don't understand what's going on. They're like, eh, I'll, go. I'll just wait around until it gets better. Eh, I don't know. Let's just wait until it gets better. So figuring things out is not a skill that we have been taught. As a society, it's not like generally how we approach things, right? There's a formula and you follow the formula. So we are a formulaic society. And we are a generation of people who needs to figure things out growing up in a society that is formulaic. And this is the problem. So this is why figuring things out feels hard. So this is where I'll give you guys just a little bit of a, you know, tip on how to approach this. So this is where like going to therapy is very helpful. So that can help with some of this stuff. Um, coaching can also help with this kind of stuff. This is closer to the kind of stuff that we do in coaching which is that we help people sort of figure out like what they want from life, right? It's about like figuring out what you want, what motivates you, how to accomplish your hopes and dreams, how to figure out what your motive, your hopes and dreams are. So just, I'll give you guys just one example of something that we train our coaches in. This is something called the drive matrix. So there's shoulds, wants, uh, duties, and values. So as a human being, what motivates you to act? Like what quadrant are you operating from? And so a lot of us, what, what we'll do is we'll operate from like this half, right? Things that we should do, like get a 4.0. Things that we want to do, like play video games. We don't operate from what we care about. We operate from what we should do. And why is that? It's because society has told that like the formulaic society operates from here, right? The self-driven society needs to start operating from here. So this is just like a simple thing that we'll teach our coaches, which is like when someone comes in the door, I don't think most people think about this, right? They don't really think about what motivates them. And this is why motivation is gone, because if you're motivated by one of these quadrants in particular, and then that quadrant fails you, then you don't know how to find motivation elsewhere. 
So the process of coaching is sort of doing this introspective work to try to figure out, okay, what do you care about? Because once you start moving towards what you care about, once you start moving towards what you feel responsible for, that will actually inspire you to work despite the fact that things don't go your way. So this is where the concept of dharma comes in, right? So dharma is that which allows you to do the hard thing gladly. So I, I don't want to be shot, but I can absolutely take a bullet for one of my kids. And why it's like this outcome is the same, like pain and death. But one of them motivates me to do it very, very clearly. And that's dharma. So what we need to start doing is operating from these two quadrants. And so that involves like a introspective process, which starts with this. Okay. Um, how much I have let myself down and let my parents down. So this is where we're going to go. Like we're going to start asking why. Okay. So let parents down. Let myself down. So you need to ask yourself why, like what, how did you let yourself down? Where did you come up with the expectations for yourself? Where did your parents come up with their expectations from you? Do you actually, when you think about it critically, do you agree with those expectations or not agree with those expectations? Where do you develop a standard for how you should behave? Where did you decide or why did you decide that not sleeping and not eating is worth a 4.0, right? These are the kinds of deep introspective questions that you need to be asking yourself. Like what actually drives this human being forward? And as you go through that process, what you're going to do is develop a new standard. And once you get here, then things are going to be good. Because now you've developed a standard that is not based on an archaic formula, but is based on introspection, is personalized to you. And that's a standard that you can was developed by you, right? You're the one who's invested in it. You're the one who came up with it. You've decided, okay, how much am I willing to work? I want a 4.0, sure. But I'm not willing to sacrifice more than one hour of sleep a day. So I'm going to sleep a minimum of seven hours a day. And I'm going to eat two square meals a day. Maybe not three. I can give up one meal. That's totally fine. This is the price that I'm willing to pay. And this is the goal that I want. And oftentimes what that means is sacrifice on the other side, right? If that means a 3.5, that's totally fine. Now I've set a boundary with myself that I'm not willing to sacrifice my mental health, my physical health for the sake of a number on a transcript. And if that means that employers don't like me for having a 4.0 instead of having, if I need a 4.0 and I'm not going to get the job, so be it. Because so far, what's happening is we're all living to a standard that is not our own. Like, why is a 4.0 important? I'm not hearing anything about what this person learned or how much they enjoyed it or how they're looking forward to things. It's just living to an external standard, what my parents want, what the school wants, what I believe job app, uh, jo uh, employers want, right? So you have to develop a standard to live by for yourself. Because the formulas just don't work anymore. Like, I'm not saying that living a formula, uh, uh, living to a formula is inherently bad. There are lots of advantages to it. There's a reason why it's worked for the majority of human history, right? Like, generally speaking, we've had a functioning society and things have moved forward. And yet now society is changing, right? And this is a big part of it, is that the formula just doesn't work. So we can't rely on formulaic solutions anymore. And so what we have to do is like, be more self-directed and it's harder. It's very hard. We'll talk about that in a second. So in conclusion, you know, this is a case or situation of someone who is in an early life crisis. And how do we get to an early life crisis? Well, it starts with certain personal vulnerabilities, right? The desire to excel, the motivation to sacrifice. When we take those personal vulnerabilities and we stick us in a society that has increasing amounts of objective input for less output, right? So like other examples of this is how many hours do you need to work at minimum wage to pay for college? How many hours do you need to work to buy a home? So what we're seeing is an inflation of effort. So when you take someone who's motivated to sacrifice and wants to be the best, plus an inflation of effort and the limitations of the human body, what you end up with is burnout and an early life crisis. 
The way to get through that, first of all, is to make sure that there's nothing medically or mentally going on, right? So if you've got a physical or mental manifestation of illness, those need to be absolutely treated because it's going to be impl- like if you're like addicted to marijuana or addicted to alcohol or something like that, and you're trying to get out of this ditch, it's going to be very hard. So you got to get sober, got to get healthy. Next thing is to start thinking a little bit about how to set boundaries, how to set boundaries with yourself, how to set boundaries with technology, because technology is just going to kick you while you're down, right? How to set boundaries with parents, significant others, friends, with potential employers, how to set boundaries with yourself. And then it's like the introspective work of figuring out what you want and how you're motivated. And then like using that to develop a standard to live your life by. And once you've done that, then you've gone through the crisis. And the reason I I outline these steps is because for the people who have gotten through the crisis, this is what they look like when they come out on the other side. They've developed a standard for themselves. They've said, okay, these are my limits. This is what I'm willing to put in. This is what I'm willing to, this is where I draw the line. And when they do that, then they have like direction and purpose and they're motivated and they don't like, you know, spend too much of themselves, wind themselves, like find themselves being burnt out and then like lose all their progress anyway. So that's what you really have to do. And this is why the, uh, the early life crisis is becoming increasingly common because we have a, a, a whole host of people who the baby boomers are incorrect. It's not that we're lazy. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The reason that burnout is so bad is because we care too much and we work too hard, right? And the, the, the playing field just wasn't as level as it used to be. And this is why we're getting a, an unprecedented level of laying flat, burning out, early life crisis. Questions? That was 51 minutes. Wow. Okay. Wanted to keep it shorter, but oh well. Okay. Someone's asking me what was my biggest ditch. Um, I mean, so like I was in basically the same ditch. Uh, You could say objectively in some ways I was in a worse ditch because my GPA was a 2.5 when I finished college, right? So like, I I mean, my worst ditch was probably when I was 19 years old, had like a 1.0 GPA, was a second year freshman in college, right? I would shower every day but would spend most of my days just in front of technology, like shirking my responsibilities, lying to my parents, all that kind of stuff, not knowing what I wanted to do in life, feeling paralyzed to do anything. Like I understood that I should study, like I needed to study, I needed to bring my GPA up. But the more I needed to do something, the more crushing it felt. Like it was this weird paradoxical thing where I I wanted nothing more than for what I needed to inspire me to act. But actually, like, the terrifying thing was that instead of, like, what I saw in the movies, which is, like, when, when the hero or heroine is, like, digs deep and finds that extra burst of energy and then overcomes their, like, problems and triumphs in the end, what I found is that, like, the digger I, the deeper I dug, the more into the ditch I found myself. Like, I was digging and digging and digging and looking for some magical source of inspiration. But instead of finding gold, I was just digging myself, like, further and further and further. Right. And that's the ditch. It's like I wanted nothing more than to wake up one day and be inspired to change my life. But I wasn't. I was just more devastated and crushed by how much I had to fix. And every day that I went went by, I needed to fix more because I've fallen more behind. And the more that I've fallen behind, the more that I have to retreat and distract myself and would play Warcraft 3 and Diablo 2 for hours on end. And so it became a vicious cycle that every day just crushed me more and more and more and more and more. That's my lowest. Right? So what did I do? I started by setting boundaries and then figuring out what I wanted. So the first boundary that I set with myself for myself is that I was like, okay, I'm going to go to India. What am I going to get there? I have no idea. Right? And this is where my mind would scream at me. It's not efficient. You're wasting your time. 
How is going to India going to help you get a 4.0? I had no idea. But I said, I got to do something. So I set a boundary with myself that this is not working and I need to do something else. And my mind screamed at me, but I don't know if that's going to work. And I was like, okay, we're going to try it anyway. It doesn't need to work. We don't need the guarantee of success in order to expend effort. So also something that's very, very paralyzing. And then while I was there, I discovered what I wanted, right? And then once I discovered what I wanted, I set a standard for myself. And my standard was, I'm going to become a successful doctor. And why was that the standard? It was somewhat arbitrary. It was simply because I couldn't run away from life. So it was like, I could have done anything else. It's just, I need to pick some goal and I need to achieve it. And it needs to be high. It can't be easy. It needs to be difficult. And if I can't do that, I'm not going to succeed in my spiritual studies. That was the standard that I set for myself. And that's how I got out of the ditch. Yeah, so someone's saying, I set standards, but then don't follow through. That's because the standards that you set are not based on introspection. So this is a really important point. A lot of the standards that we set from ourselves come from the should quadrant. They're the standards we should set for ourselves. They're not truly our standard. They're either the standard that we aspire to, the standard that we want, or the standard that we should have. Right? I shouldn't eat fried food anymore. I should work out every day. So we call this setting a standard for ourselves, but it's not truly setting a standard. It's just being motivated by shoulds. So be careful. The real standard that you set for yourself that you will keep is the one that is developed through like introspection and awareness. Okay. All right. If you guys want to, we can talk a little bit about a meditation for the early life crisis. So this is going to be a little bit different. Okay? So. People who, you know, watch the segment on the early life crisis are going to be confused by step three, which is how do I figure things out, right? Like, because we don't know how to do that. All we know how to do is follow formulas because that's what our parents did. And that's what their parents did. And that's what their parents did. So society has grown up with formulas, right? Like it's like you get a job. The concept of a job is a formula. Y'all get that? It's like you have a set degree of duties. Like you go into a place, they say, do these five things. And then we will pay you this amount of money. It's all formulaic. So how do I figure things out? How do I figure out what I want? It's a very common question. Good one, right? So the answer is awareness. Awareness is what we lack. We all live on autopilot and we lack awareness. So formulas and autopilot go hand in hand, right? Once I have the formula in place, I can go on autopilot. And the mind loves nothing more than autopilot. So this is one thing you have to understand about the mind. So if you have a choice between brushing your teeth with your dominant hand or your non-dominant hand, right? Let's assume that most people are right hand dominant. Which one is your mind going to prefer? It prefers the dominant hand. Why is that? Because the non-dominant hand is harder. What makes the non-dominant hand harder? It's because you can't do it on autopilot. It requires awareness and effort. Okay? So for the mind really loves doing things on autopilot and hates doing things that require effort and awareness. This is why learning things is difficult. So another good example of this is like learning an instrument. So if you're learning a musical instrument for the first time, it requires a ton of awareness. You can't do anything automatically. It's not fun. Awareness is like very, very painful for the mind. The flip side of this is dopaminergic activities. Why does the mind love dopaminergic activities? Why does it love watching videos and binge watching shows and playing video games and social media and stuff like that? It's because it activates autopilot. It's like a hard on to the autopilot, right? Because you can turn that on and then you can like be on autopilot. Your mind can gel out. You lose all awareness. It's like a technological heroin. And then eight hours later, you like come up for air. Okay? So the mind will do anything it can to move away from awareness and move towards an autopilot. So... The mind also loves to like grind, 
right? Because if you think about the prospect of grinding, it's like an autopilot activity. It doesn't require any thought or introspection or things like that. And so since our mind loves to grind, we end up feeling kind of burnt out. So whether you're watching YouTube all day or you're grinding at work or studying super hard, you feel burnt out at the end of all of it, right? Because at the end of autopilot, you feel very, very tired. Even though it's easy, you feel tired, which is kind of weird and paradoxical. So then the question is, how do we unburn out? How do we get over burnout? How do we start to introspect? And so the answer is actually relatively simple, right? And it's what people have been saying for thousands of years, is that you need to live life with awareness. And so then the question kind of becomes, how do we do that, right? So here's the meditation technique. You guys could start doing it now if you want to. I'll give you guys a second. But what we're going to do is walk slowly, okay? And you may say, like, what does that mean, walk slowly? So already notice how the mind, so I want you to really pay attention to what your mind does as I give you the instructions. So the mind is going to be like, that sounds really, really simple, right? So like, doesn't it need to be more complex? Because this is another thing about the mind. The mind loves difficulty and it hates simplicity. So this is a, a kind of an interesting aside. But when you give the mind a simple task, it says it's too simple and decides not to do it. When you give the mind a complex task, it says, yay, let's do it. Let's set an impossible standard for ourselves because it's complicated. It gives me lots of things to think about. I have to figure it out. I have to figure out a problem solve. And even better is when I fail the, the complex task, I will create emotional energy in the mind and I continue to exist. I get to feel bad about myself and I get to start thinking about myself as a failure. And so this is really, really bizarre. But if you really think about it, every time our mind denies us a simple task, it denies us the possibility of success. It's easy to do a simple task. You could do 10 simple tasks a day. You could be successful at 10 things today and you could feel good about yourself. But your mind doesn't want that. It wants complex tasks that'll fail. Why? It's because failure gives food to the mind. Failure allows your mind to run on autopilot. It's a never ending source of energy for thoughts to bounce around in your head, right? Because if you fail, you're not gonna be bored. Boredom is what the mind hates. Awareness is what the mind hates. So walk slowly. So you can try this now. You can get up and take a step back from your chair. And I want you to start walking, I guess, back and forth because you're going to be listening to me. Walk slowly. All right? And then your mind is going to say, like, how slowly? Good question. Slower. Right? Just slower. Just walk slowly. So then what's going to happen is your mind is going to want to kick into autopilot. It's like, let's move faster. This doesn't feel right. Like, let's just go, right? And then it's going to be asking questions like, should I walk slower? Is this slow enough? Am I doing it right? And then comes a very important thing. Because if your mind says, am I doing it right? What is it trying to do? If you say yes, then it gets, it's like, cool, we figured this out. Autopilot on. No more awareness necessary right? The mind is struggling to move away from awareness into autopilot. And so I want you to walk slower and keep, just walk slowly, just walk as with awareness slowly. And then you should say, okay, should I walk as slow as possible? And that too is the mind's desire to figure out what autopilot looks like. So walk slowly. And then the mind may do all kinds of things. It's going to be like, you look like an idiot, right? So you can go for a walk and you can walk slowly in public. And then your mind will rebel against all of that stuff. It's like, you're just walking slowly. People can think whatever they want to. And then we can see ego arise. We can see all this one practice will show you all of the like weaknesses of the mind. Just walk slowly. And then the mind, even some of you five heads out there will be like, but how slow can you walk? Like, can you walk slower and slower and slower? Like if you're saying walk slowly, do I need to walk slower? And the answer is yes, you should walk slower. They're like, but I can go even slower and slower and slower and slower and slower. And then at some point, won't I stop moving? I'll be like, yes, you will stop moving, but you should still be walking. So you won't ever truly stop moving, but it'll look like you're stop you've stopped moving. And then you'll understand like you'll be a Zen master because at that point you've discovered how to walk without moving. 
right? And once you learn that, then you'll be enlightened. GG. <laughs> so, if you want to learn how to live with awareness, if you want to learn how to stop living on autopilot, just walk slowly and notice everything that comes up in your mind. And then you'll begin to appreciate like this is the thing that is controlling your life. All of these like desires and intentions and standards and all that crap. It throws so many things at you. It's desperate. It's like then suddenly the mind is the one that's being put in the ditch. And it's going to rebel and try to find autopilot however it can. And if you're sitting there and you haven't done this, or you don't plan on doing it, notice that too. Your mind is like, oh, better not do this. So it may even convince you to not try. Because like, it's recognizing on some level that this could be the end of it. Like it won't get to run your life anymore if you do this practice successfully. So be careful. That's all it takes. Just walk slowly. It's a simple thing, a tiny thing. Walk slowly. Pole pole is exactly what they said to me when I was trying to learn, or when I was climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. Right? And that's where it's like, it's like these kinds of practices when, you know, you'll see Zen practices like listen to the sound of a rock growing. And you look at that and you're like, how on earth does that work? But actually, if you understand meditation, you can absolutely understand how that works. Right? It's going to be the same as walking without moving. So walk without moving. Walk slower, 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 slower. And then we see the Zen tradition, like the reason it kind of works is because it forces you into awareness and destroys autopilot. And once you destroy autopilot, then like suddenly you're living life intentionally. You're living life with focus. You're not just like chasing this kind of distraction and running away from this thing because those are all autopilot responses. I'm going to retreat to my room so my parents don't make snide comments. Autopilot response. You can have some awareness of it. You can have some insight of it. But in that moment, when you walk into your room and you shut the door and you wait until they go to bed to come down to the kitchen to eat your dinner at 10.30 p.m., you're not sitting there with those thoughts constantly. It's all autopilot. And so awareness is the foundation of figuring things out and understanding yourself. Right? We got to collect data. We got to like see what it is. And then once you start doing that, you'll break out of the autopilot. Okay? Questions before we move on to dating. Can you show us how to apply it to situations in life? No. You don't apply to situations in life. What you do is the meditative practice, and then you will literally learn how to turn off autopilot and operate with awareness. Once you gain that skill, then you can change your life. So this is the way I'd put it. It's kind of like asking me, if I work out, can you, can you show us how to like lift 300 pounds? No, I can't show you how to lift 300 pounds because it's a skill. I can tell you how to lift weights, and then you yourself will be able to lift 300 pounds, but I cannot show you how to lift 300 pounds. What I'm saying is awareness is a skill that needs to be developed. Can awareness make you feel bad? No. Awareness can be aware of your bad feelings. Okay? Is that... I know it's tricky, but no. Generally speaking, not really. Awareness can only show you what already is. It doesn't create anything, right? It's just an observation. So I'll leave you all with just one thing. Maybe this is going to be a lecture for a different day. It's a relatively advanced concept, but I know that a lot of people have been studying for a while. So, you know, we've talked about the different parts of the mind. So there's manas, which is your emotional mind, buddhi, which is intellect, chitta, which is your unconscious or the storehouse of the mind that stores your samskars or memory impressions. When Patanjali says yoga chitta vrutta nirodha, he's saying he's describing enlightenment. And what he says is that yoga or enlightenment, union, yuj, 
is the achievement of cessations of the fluctuation of the chitta. So this oftentimes gets translated as enlightenment is the cessation of fluctuations of the mind. Okay? Oftentimes how it gets translated. But if you're really careful, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying the mind. He's saying chitta. So the abolishment of fluctuations within the chitta. It doesn't say abolishment of fluctuations within the manas or abolishment of fluctuations within the buddhi. He says abolishment of fluctuations within the chitta. So what that means is not that you won't feel sad or angry anymore. And this is the big paradox. is because people assume that enlightenment means that you don't feel sadness or joy or anger or fear or anything like that. But those are all parts of the manas. And so paradoxically, what happens, and if you understand these, these nuances, then it could kind of make sense. You can continue to live life, and in fact, you live life more fully. People assume that what that means is if you become enlightened, you become apathetic. No, because you still have manas, you still enjoy things, you still get afraid, you still, you know, feel emotions. But the storehouse of impressions that interprets all of those things and attaches, like, consequences to them, is that's what gets cleaned out. So fear in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it can be quite enjoyable. If you played a game like Resident Evil Village or you watch a horror movie, you understand that fear too can be enjoyed. So what makes the fear from a Resident Evil Village game or like horror movie, what makes it enjoyable? It is the interpretation of and context around it, right? Because I know it's a game. I know it's not real. Therefore, even a negative emotion can feel good. It is the context around it, and that is the chitta. So once the chitta becomes pure, the context around all of the experiences of life becomes pleasant. That is what true yoga is. So I, I don't know if people understood that or not, but like, that's the challenge that we face, right? It's like, there's like a lot of advanced stuff to talk about. It's just, we want to try to strike a balance between like, for people who have been here for a while, giving y'all like the next step. And then like, but if you, if this is your first time on stream and like, I'm saying, okay, like if you don't know what the chitta is, then it doesn't make any sense. But a lot of the confusion around enlightenment comes from actually an imprecise understanding of the mind. It's not buddhi vritti narodaha or mana, mano vritti narodaha. It's chitta vritti narodaha. Right? So that's what it means to be enlightened. That's why it's like ego death. Because then suddenly like, sure, I'm still enjoying, I can still enjoy a taco or I can enjoy, you know, some medicine. It, it, because all the context, the chitta is what's purified. Yeah, so when Adon FJ is saying detachment from the context, I would say, is perfect, right? And so that now you begin to see if you're detached from the context, then you can act with complete freedom. So I can go on a date and like not worry about whether the person likes me or not, doesn't like me, right? I can enjoy the date. The, the, the date can be pleasant or it can be unpleasant. But like to me, it makes it, it's like an unpleasant date, so I'm just not going to do it again. But I don't leave the date with all the context. Being like, oh my God, I did such a ba bad job at dating. Oh my God, like the date was a mess and it's my fault. That's the context that your mind adds. That's the vritti which is created in the chitta. That's what needs to be purified through the practice of yoga. Not the experience of the date. You can still experience crappy dates. It's just all the crap you attach to it, which is the source of our suffering. And if you really like, if you pay attention to experience, you'll realize this, that like, you can have unpleasant experiences which you won't gravitate towards, but they won't cause too much suffering. Like, I'll give you guys just a simple example. Sometimes when I'm driving home, I have to stop for gas, right? And if we technically think about it, like stopping for gas is an inconvenience. It costs me money. It like means that I get to play five minutes less of Dota. Like, it's a purely negative experience, objectively. It is purely negative. There's no advantage to stopping for gas. And yet, why aren't we bent out of shape that thousands of human beings like stop for gas or millions of human beings stop for gas all the time? 
It's because of our attachments to it, right? It's just like, whatever. I have to do it. So be it. Kind of sucks. Eh, let me just move on with my life. Get a Tesla. Sure. So now there's some people with Teslas. <laughs> okay. Right? Okay. Should we talk about dating? Let's do it. Hehefen? Hehefem wants to talk about dating. Let's do it. We doing good, chat? We're going to run it. We started late today, so we can run a little bit over, okay? And we've done meditation for today, okay? Chatars? All right. <clears throat> so, give you all a choice while I rest my voice. So we've got one post, which is going to be about the dating scene, right? Let's understand what dating is doing to us. We've got another post about understanding if you're ready for love. So one's a little bit more commentary. One is a little bit more personal. Which one do y'all want to do? We may have time for only one, but we can try to cover the other one later. Poll, 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 poll. Are you ready for love? By Dr. K. Are you ready for love? All right, let's talk about whether you're ready for love. You ready for love, chat? Yeah, my God. <clears throat> okay. This is a fantastic post. So I'm, I, I just got to start with, I love, dude, I love y'all so much. Like, so here's what's fantastic. I know I've said this uh, several times, but I'm going to keep saying it because it keeps happening. The level of introspection that people in this community have about their experiences of things is going so high that we can get a lot of awesome stuff out of these posts. So these are no longer like simple posts where it's like, I'm having trouble dating. I don't know where to start. Right. Those are all like very like, I, I don't know what to do with that. A start at the beginning, I suppose. But this post is going to have a lot of great insight into the experience of someone who's struggling to figure out whether they're ready for love. So let's take a look. How can you understand if you're ready for love? Hello, everyone. I have a question for the community. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about love, and I don't understand if my desire for love is just a way to escape from the feeling of loneliness. People often say things like, you need to feel good by yourself to enjoy another person. Or love comes when you least expect it. And I agree. I feel good by myself, but I also want a relationship, and I think I am ready for it. But is thinking this a sign that I am not ready? I am in therapy for some common struggles, and sometimes I think that this is a sign that a relationship is not for me right now. But thought like this can lead to a spiral of inadequacy. Like, I need to few, lose a few pounds to be ready. I need to have a better job to be ready. I need to have a, a house to be ready, and so on. I'm doing a lot of introspection, but I can't find a way out. Another thing, is that, another thing that's haunting me is I want to meet new people because I'm an introvert, with just a couple of friends, and I want to live more and think less. I thought about things that I really enjoy, like group hiking or some photography course, but I'm not sure if I really want these things, if I want to do these things, or if it's just to meet people and potentially a partner. If I go to these activities with this kind of expectation, I will not truly enjoy them. And I will certainly not find love because it comes when you least expect it. So I'm stuck and I don't know how to get out of this rut. Is there some video or interview that I can watch that can get a little insight into what's going on in my head? Sorry for the poor vocabulary or if I made mistakes. I follow you from Italy. So grazie dell'attenzione. Buona giornata a tutti. Thank you for atten your attention. And have a nice day, everyone. So unfortunately, there is not a question specifically about that. Or, and that's why we're going to answer it, right? So let's start with this. Okay. So here are the, the, the let's start by breaking down the questions. So the first is like, this person feels lonely. Okay. What is the relationship between loneliness and looking for love? Because a lot of people will say that 
you know, you need to like be content with yourself in order to truly find a good relationship. So what's the relationship between loneliness and love? Second question is like, how do you know if you're ready for love? Right? Because people will say all kinds of, they'll give you all kinds of like general advice. Like, you know, you should be, like I said, you should be happy for yourself or love comes when you least expect it. So how do you know if you are ready for love? And conversely, how do you know if you're not ready for love? Okay. Next thing that people come up to is that they're struggling with particular things, right? They, they're, they're things that they're working on, a sense of inadequacy. They haven't achieved their professional goals. Um, you know, they may not be ready, like from a physical standpoint, they want to feel healthier. They want to feel more attractive. So what's the relationship between like common struggles or being in therapy and like looking for love? Do I need to, you know, do I need to be like done with therapy before I'm ready for a relationship? Like, how do I know when I'm ready and what do common struggles have to do with it? And the last thing is this business of expectations. So I want to live life, but I'm worried about like, you know, finding, and I also want to like find love. And so people will say things, they'll give me advice like, oh, you should go and like go meet people, like go get out there. Right. But then which is per good advice, but I think what, what I appreciate about, this com appreciate about this community is that good advice isn't enough, right? Because you can't just go out there and do it. There's all kinds of thoughts that come with you when you go out there and do it. Like, am I doing this to find a partner? Is this, like, why am I really getting out there? And can I get out there? If everyone's saying that the way to find a relationship is to get out there and I start getting out there, how do I actually enjoy the thing? Because people also say, don't look for it. Just enjoy the thing and then I'll be my best self. I'll be enjoying myself. So like, how do I, how do I reconcile these thing, th things? Subconsciously, am I really looking for a relationship or am I looking to do this thing? I don't really know because it gets really confusing, right? So all really excellent questions. So let's start at the top. Y'all want iPad for this or no iPad? What do y'all think? Writing? We can go e either way. Always iPad. Okay. It seems like people want iPad. That's fine. We can do it. Okay. So let's start from the top, right? So why do we feel lonely? So let's try to start by thinking a little bit about, you know, what is the, you know, why do we get lonely? And the issue here is that if I feel lonely, am I ready for a relationship? Because people say that, you know, you're ready for a relationship when you can be content by yourself, right? People say that. Let's just keep track of people say. Or actually, let's put this here. Okay. So the first thing to understand is that loneliness is just a signal from our body or our mind the way that other signals exist. So we have signals like hunger, right? We have thirst, and we have loneliness. So in and of itself, I would say if you feel lonely, you should probably look for a relationship, right? We'll get to why you may not be ready for one. But loneliness in and of itself is just a, a signal. So some part of you is telling you, hey, by the way, like we need some kind of companionship, right? And let's like try to understand that from an evolutionary standpoint. Like why do human beings feel lonely? Right? When do they feel lonely? Well, like if we didn't have some kind of signal telling us to eat, and we didn't have some kind of signal telling us to drink, and we didn't have some kind of signal telling us to like, you know, find a companion, then you, the human race probably wouldn't exist, right? Because like procreation is a central part of like human drivers and survival. So, and loneliness isn't necessarily about procreation because there are all kinds of other benefits to companionship that are not just procreation, right? So like, for example, there, there's uh, lots of evidence that shows that social capital has positive effects on mental health, buffers things like depression, anxiety, helps us increase motivation, keeps us interested in things, stimulates our intellect. So there are all kinds of benefits to companionship. Maybe the top of the list for the sake of the human race and on an evolutionary time scale is procreation. But for an individual, loneliness is just a signal from your body and or your mind, right? Because remember that your mind has physiologic correlates like oxytocin and stuff like that. 
So when you hug someone and you get a spurt of oxytocin in your brain, you feel less lonely and you feel more connected. So loneliness is just a signal. So if you feel loneliness, I would say you should follow it in the same way that if you feel hungry, you should follow it. In the same way that if you feel thirsty, you should follow it. And also with the same caveats, right? Because we don't always want to give in to hunger. We don't always want to give in to thirst. And we don't always want to give in to loneliness. But generally speaking, I would say listen to it. So then the question becomes, when are you ready? And now a lot of people will think that you have to meet certain requirements in order to be ready. So for example, I need to lose a few pounds, I need to have a better job, I need to have a house to be ready. And in my experience, a lot of the reasons that you may not be ready, that your mind produces from you, really have to do with your sense of inadequacy as opposed to readiness, if that makes sense. Right? So this isn't like, it's not that you're not ready. I mean, because it's like, people can have successful relationships if they're a few pounds heavier. They can have successful relationships without a house. In fact, it's very common for, you know, couples to purchase a house or get housing for the first time together, right? So you don't have to check all these boxes. So if you're feeling like you have to check boxes, you know, checking boxes could be a form of procrastination. And in, in turn, could be a sense of inadequacy, which I think this person's already figured out. That's a really common one. So let's just understand that for a second. So what does this have to do with inadequacy? Well, if I feel, if I'm not confident in myself and I feel inadequate, what I have to do is stack as many advantages as I can in my favor to increase the odds of success because I don't want failure, right? So if I'm not brave enough to face failure, if I'm not prepared for rejection because I feel inadequate, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna like, you know, get in shape, I'm gonna, get money, and I'm going to get a house. And this will make me a more attractive mate, will increase my probability of success, and therefore will alleviate the inadequacy. That's what we hope, right? And the truth is that you don't need any of those things. I mean, all of those, you know, all those things may help. They may help, they may make you more attractive to partners. I'm not saying they aren't, but this is where like, you know, your readiness... You may be ready for a relationship, but you still carry some of those inadequacies with you. And I think it's actually completely normal or even healthy to see a therapist while you're looking for or in a relationship. So I do not think that be seeing a therapist is like a precursor or, or exclusion criteria for entering into a relationship. You don't have to fix yourself. I mean, there may be some things which we'll get to in a second. You don't have to like fix yourself perfectly before you start looking for a relationship, right? Because the truth of the matter is that like most relationships, uh, not most, 99.99999% of relationships happen between flawed individuals. Like that's just the truth of it, right? Because what is a perfect individual? Like how do you get to perfect? Like you can't. Right? It's an unattainable standard. So I know, for example, like I started dating the woman who's now my wife when I was like 21 and like had a, like a 2.0 GPA and didn't have my crap together and any like had no. And then she continued to date me despite the fact that I had no job prospects, no financial prospects, like none of that stuff. Right. So she dated an absolute loser. And like, that's OK. Like you can date absolute losers like that's part of the dating process. The, the, the sad truth or happy truth, depending on how you look at it, and we're going to talk about mindset, mindset shifts in a second, is that like, you know, the, the good news is that there are successful relationships with losers. People don't stay losers the rest of their life. Some people grow and change, especially with the support of a significant other. So you don't need to be perfect. And being, seeing, therapy, seeing a therapist does not preclude you from being ready for a relationship. And I would think that you're kind of ready for a relationship. We'll get to that in a second. But then, obviously, there are some things that make people not ready. So what are the signs that you aren't ready? 
And as a therapist, I will say that there are many people that are, many of my patients who have not been ready for relationships, right? So there absolutely are reasons that human beings are not ready for relationships. Some of those reasons involve therapy, but it's not like therapy in and of itself means you're not ready for a relationship. In fact, quite the opposite. A lot of times it means that you're actually more ready because you're doing, you're taking working on yourself, which is a vital thing for success in a relationship. And you're working at it in like an intentional way, right? So you're like boosting your EQ, solving your own issues, working through your own issues, trying to become a better person. And the person who is at that stage of personal growth is going to be far more successful in a relationship than someone who is oblivious and narcissistic and doesn't think that they need to improve anything, right? So what are the reasons that you aren't ready? So there's one big thing which can manifest in all kinds of different ways. And that's when you have a core, usually psychological, but it can actually be physical too, need that you um, fill in the relationship that isn't a relationship thing. So you have like a separate need, okay? And so oftentimes your desire or your need gets filled at the cost or in spite of red flags. So this is the main reason that you're not ready for a relationship. If you are using a relationship to fill some kind of core need that is not relationship related, that's, that needs to be fixed. So I'll give you guys an example. So if I am so terrified of loneliness that like I cannot exist by myself and that loneliness is so crippling that I'll take anyone including an abuser, just to stave off the feeling of loneliness, then you're not in a relationship, right? So loneliness can be a signal to reach for a relationship. And when the signal is so incredibly powerful that it becomes pathologic, be causes you to ignore red flags, and then you'll start to engage in unhealthy relationships to meet that need, that's when I'd say you're not ready for a relationship. Another good example of this is like, unfortunately, sometimes I've worked with people who are addicted to substances and they will engage in romantic relationships as a means to get greater access to the substance. I've also worked with people who engage in relationships and the primary draw that they bring to the relationship is their access to the substance, right? Their main selling point is that if you date me, I can hook you up. So this is another example of whether it's a psychological need, physical need, physiologic need. But at that point, what we see is the foundation of the relationship is fulfilling the core psychological need or the core need that is not relationship related. We also see this in, in other kind of like semi-pathologic ways where like, you know, we have people who need to be taken care of. And this is independent of gender. Okay, so like sometimes you'll have, you know, people who are losers who need to be taken care of. I, I don't mean that to be harsh, but I just mean that to like get an image in your mind, right? So if I'm like unable to take care of myself, if I can't do laundry, if I can't cook for myself, if I can't do certain basic human things, I may need a relationship for someone to handle that stuff for me. So that I do not think is the foundation of a healthy relationship. On the flip side is that I may need someone to financially provide for me. I may not be able to like, um, you know, be able to like live on my own and live independently. Therefore, I will take whatever comes along that will provide me with the security that I need. Now, I'm not, in a sense, blaming that person because sometimes people fall on desperate times. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying if you're trying to figure out, am I ready for a relationship? If you're looking for some kind of serious secondary gain from the relationship, I don't think you're ready for a relationship. The real solution for that person is to develop independence in that need. Now, I'm not saying that you can't be dependent on your partner for a particular thing and that there shouldn't be a division of labor. Like it's very common for a lot of relationships to have some kind of division in labor. It's very common in relationships to have one partner do more lifting than the other partner. I've never seen a relationship that is perfectly 50-50. So we're not saying that you can't divide things within a relationship and that your partner cannot provide you with something. The key thing here is that if your soul way of getting that need met is through a relationship, 
then you are compromising the integrity of the relationship to get that need met. Does that make sense? So the, another way to put this is, when are you not ready for a relationship? When you use the relationship to fix something else in your life. In a nutshell, right? So this is where it's kind of interesting, right? Because we'll, we'll even have people from like kind of the never dated, forever alone incel crowd who are not ready for relationships. And why is that, right? Even though what they want more than anything else in the world is a relationship. Why aren't they ready? It's because they're using it to fulfill another need. It's a sense of inadequacy. It's a sense of shame. It's like they tie so many things up to a relationship that actually make it hard for them to engage in healthy relationships. And then it becomes a self-defeating cycle. So being in therapy doesn't mean that you're not ready for a relationship. The only thing that makes you not ready for a relationship is when you use that relationship to attain other means. And that's when you like, those are the kinds of things that you should work on, right? So if I'm using relationships as a way to get drugs, like I'm not ready for a real relationship, right? So now let's talk a little bit about activities and expectations. So at this point, we can kind of, con I mean, based on my reading of this, I don't know too many details, details about this person, but I'd say they're ready for a relationship, right? I think like that's their way of sort of their brain telling them like, hey, like I'm ready for a relationship. They're working on themselves. It seems like they, you know, could be better physically. They could be better professionally. They could be better maybe academically, like whatever stage of life they're in. We're not really sure. And that's totally fine. Like human beings are a work in progress. Life is a work in progress. And maybe now that you've got a couple things sorted out, you've already got a, a therapist, you're already working on your inadequacy. It sounds to me like you're ready. So then the question becomes, okay, how do I find a partner? Right? Like, because like, should I do things that I love? get out there or and what's the purpose of getting out there should i get out there you know like is it about going hiking or is it about hunting for a partner doing a hike right like which is it like what what am I, what am i really doing here and i think the person has sort of in a sense figured this out so this is what i would say so, you know, what I'm hearing from this is um, I thought about things that I really enjoy, like group hiking and some photography, but I'm not really sure if I want to do these things or if it's just to meet people and potentially a partner. And so I, I'd kind of take a, a little bit of a mindset shift here. And I'd say, even if it is for the potential of meeting a partner, even if you, as you acknowledge that potential, like going hiking and learning photography is a pretty cool price to pay for looking for a partner. So let's say you go out there and even you tell, you acknowledge to yourself that a major reason that I'm doing this is to meet someone, right? You have to acknowledge that. You have to think a little bit about your expectations. I'm not expecting to meet someone, right? I, I, I acknowledge that I may not meet someone, but I do also have this goal in mind, which I think is completely fair, right? It's eyes wide open. So eyes wide open and prepare for disappointment. We had an interesting post about that the other day, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, I just realized. Well, so maybe we'll do that one last. So like, I think it's co totally fine to you know be honest with yourself and acknowledge that you're doing this for one of the goals that you're doing this is to find a partner. The other way to kind of think about it is that even if I don't find a partner, at least I went group hiking and like I did some pretty cool hiking. At least I learned how to take pictures Instead of going to speed dating or an explicit, like, instead of spending like four hours on dating apps a week, I went out and I like learned a useful skill. So in my, in my mind, like it doesn't have to be an either or it can actually be both as long as you acknowledge what the priorities are. And this actually sounds to me like a very winning strategy, right? So what I would recommend to all of you out there that are trying to think about, okay, am I doing this activity for the sake of dating? Or is it like, am I like trying to grow or am I trying to do date? You can do both. Right? And you can acknowledge that. So acknowledge your desires. Acknowledge desires. Acknowledge hopes. Even acknowledge your expectations. 
right? And acknowledge the fact that your expectations may not be met and kind of view it as, you know, I'm going here and like, I'm absolutely going to be on the lookout. And also like, I understand that going hiking for any given day, I'm not going to find the love of my life, right? I'm going to, I'm going to roll the dice and I'm going to take a chance, but I understand that in order to like, you know, win, I'm going to have to roll the dice many, 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 many more times. And what I'm going to do is choose to play at a table where even if I don't win, there's still a consolation prize, right? This is the attitude that I would encourage you to take, which is that you are ready. You should start looking. And I think it sounds like a wonderful idea to, you know, engage in activities that you otherwise may enjoy. And if you happen to meet someone along the way, then go for it, right? And see where life takes you. Put yourself out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you don't meet someone, and you may even acknowledge that, oh, well, if I'm thinking about meeting someone, I'm not going to enjoy the hike. So you just acknowledge that thought, right? You just say to yourself, well, part of this hike, I won't be able to enjoy to its fullest extent because in the back of my mind, I'm going to be thinking a little bit about finding someone. So you can even acknowledge that, right? You can say like, it's not going to be the perfect hike. Okay, but it'll still be pretty cool, right? Just acknowledge all that stuff and then and then put yourself out there. I think that that's like, it's a beautiful like strategy. And, you know, I, when I say just put yourself out there, like I acknowledge that this seems hard, but this is where I think this person is ready, right? Because they've thought through it. They've done a lot of the internal work that comes before just doing something. And this is why just doing stuff is hard is because we, you know, if I were to tell y'all just do it, that doesn't really work. But if we acknowledge that there is an internal process of developing motivation, thinking about expectations and attachments and disappointments, strategizing a little bit, that's what it takes to get to the point of doing something. So you can't start from, you know, A and jump straight to Z, but this person is not at Z. Right. This person is seeing a therapist. This person has thought a lot about it. This person is introspected. And this person is considered activities. So when, when we say just get out there, that may not work if you're moving from A to Z. But this person has already is already at B, is already at C, is already at D, is in is like in the W, X, Y range. Right. They may need to do a little bit more work. Hopefully this they're catching this and they can watch this and it helps them move one step forward, right? So we're going to do our part and try to help them move forward. But they, they really, are, I think, are ready to try to find a relationship, right? And if, if you just enjoy yourself in the meantime and like learn skills and stuff like that, I think that sounds really, really fantastic. And so for those of you who are being snide and saying, I'm stuck at A, right? So And that's why you're probably stuck because you're trying to go straight to Z. So instead, the question is, if you're stuck at A, have you done the other things? Like, what, what do you think about what kind of activities would you do to meet someone? Have you seen a therapist? You know, what kind of work have you done for yourself? Right? Are you at the point where you need to lose a few pounds or you need to lose 50 pounds? Are you at the point where you, you don't have a house yet, but you have an income or you don't have any income at all? And so as, as we sort of start to explore some of that stuff, when we talk about when you're not ready for a relationship... Is a relationship going to be a source of fulfilling other psychological needs besides companionship and relationships? Those are the steps. So even if you're at A, that's okay. Like we all start at A. Like we have to start somewhere, right? It's okay to be at A. No shame. No judgment. And at the same time, if we want to move on from A, we have to acknowledge where we are. So it can be super hard to figure out, you know, do I know if I'm ready for a relationship? Because you can always do stuff more, right? You can always lose a few pounds. You can always earn a little bit more money. You can always dress nicer. You can always do all kinds of things. You can do more int interpersonal, like introspective work. You can grow as a human. You can acquire more skills. You can always do more. So how do you know when you're ready? And it comes down to a couple of basic things. The first thing is that you're not ready if the relationship is fulfilling major needs that are not relationship related. So if you're in the relationship to fix some other problem in your life, that's really the main thing. But if the main reason you're looking for one is to, you know, really deal with companion, looking for companionship, you're ready to really find a companion, then I think go for it. You don't have to be perfect.
right? So this is where, where people are asking good questions. So one is like, is loneliness filling a need? And that's where I'd say like loneliness is a feeling, right? And it can be caused by different things. So let's use the analogy of hunger. So is loneliness a good reason to get into a relationship or not good reason to get into a relationship? So is hunger a good reason to eat or not a good reason to eat? Well, it sort of depends, right? Did you already eat a meal an hour ago? Have you hit your caloric requirement for the day? What is it that you're craving to eat, right? Is it healthy? So hunger is just a signal telling your body that it wants something. So sometimes what it wants is actually good for it, and sometimes what it wants is not good for it. And loneliness is the same way in a relationship. So loneliness is a signal to us that, hey, we're ready for a relationship. And sometimes loneliness is what we feel because we feel so isolated and alone that we're craving any kind of human connection. And what we want is this idealized partner who can like fulfill all of our gaps. So that's a case where like, you know, there's loneliness for companionship and there's like the loneliness of like pure isolation, right? And I don't think relationship is good for one of those. It's good for one. It's good for, you know, the, the desire for companionship, but I don't think it's going to fix sort of an existential sense of isolation. So there was a, <laughs> so it's kind of the same way, right? It's just a signal. And sometimes you want to listen to the signal and sometimes you don't. Um, Okay. There was one more. I saw another good question. Okay. How do you cure your ligma with with my balls? Right? Do you cure your ligma balls? <laughs> A lot more indeed. Okay. So any, any, uh, yeah, my balls will cure your ligma. I guarantee you. <laughs> right. We don't provide medical advice on stream, but that may be the one exception. <laughs> okay. Um, so <laughs> oh, I, any last questions before we wrap up for the day and who are we rating chat? Is Dr. Disrespect streaming again? Is he on? I thought he was like permaband. Is he raiding or are you guys trolling me? I can't tell. Or was that? I don't know. Kid Boga? We can raid Alinity. Maybe maybe follow the theme of dating advice and... and uh, you want to raid Alinity or should we raid who's... Uh, Tasty Life? What do y'all think? Who, who can give us dating advice, chat? Oh, we can read Stock Guy or Pokey. Pokey dating. Small, let's, let's read Small Streamer. Let's read Tasty Life. I, I don't know what is going on, but it looks cool. So read Tasty Life. Um, So my name is Tasty, but you can call me dad. So let's go ask dad about dating advice. Do we know if dad is actually in a relationship or what's going on? Oh, he's playing RuneScape. I need to figure that out. Okay. Maybe Tasty Life isn't small. Is that insulting? I didn't mean to be insulting. He has hundreds of viewers. So send Tasty Life some love and let's see what he says about dating. <laughs> 